Yeah, couldn't think of a good cold open for this video. And if you're watching this, that means not enough bloopers happen during filming. So, there you go. Greetings one and all, and welcome once again to Tom's Hit Parade. Well, we are already one quarter of the way into the new year, I can hardly believe that. But what better time than that to bring back my Spank and Platters feature? Yes, uh, it was uh, kind of intermittent over the last year, over 2020, uh, but, well, you know how 2020 was. I don't have to explain to you. Uh, but I've always intended this feature to be quarterly, and uh, that's what I'm going to try and get back on track here. So, yes, this is the winter edition of Spank and Platters. This is where I talk about albums that have come out over the past three months-ish that I have listened to and enjoyed enough to actually buy and bring home on physical format. So yes, I've got four releases to talk about this month. It was going to be five, but one of them got delayed, so that one will be in the spring edition coming up soon. You know, I promise you, I have been buying more vinyl than CDs overall, but as it so happens, uh, this month, three out of the four uh, new releases I'm talking about are actually on CD. There's only one on vinyl, so hopefully that trend toward vinyl will continue on as the months and years progress. Uh, but anyway, let's go ahead and get started on the first of the four releases, and this will be the one on vinyl that I'll be talking about here. It is Greenfield's The Gibb Brothers Songbook Volume 1. It is basically uh, put together by Barry Gibb of the Bee Gees. And I did not know about this album until the weekend it was released. And I saw an interview with Barry Gibb on CBS Sunday Morning where he discussed the album and, and its creation and, and how it came together. Although, actually, I may have heard about it weeks or months before, but if so, I forgot. But anyway, as soon as I heard about it, I had to, to go out and pick it up because just what I heard in that interview, the little clips that I heard were just wonderful and this album didn't let me down. But anyway, what the album is, is a collection of songs originally made famous by the Bee Gees, reworked by Barry Gibb into country and folk and Americana arrangements, and featuring many prominent artists from those genres, uh, such as Little Big Town and Jay Buchanan, each of those features on two of the tracks on this album, as well as other artists Barry recruited, including Olivia Newton-John, Miranda Lambert, Jason Isbell, and Brandi Carlisle. Now, as far as I can remember from the original songs, uh, they don't mess much with the tempos for these new recordings, for the most part. Uh, what were originally ballads remain ballads on this album, and what were originally upbeat songs are still upbeat on here. Now, this album reminds me a lot of the Elton John tribute albums that came out a couple of years ago. There was one of them, one of the two was a country album. You might recall it was one of my favorite albums of the year. Both of them were actually. Uh, it reminds me of that Elton John tribute album, the country album, in that I'm surprised at how well these songs translate to the country genre. It's just, it kind of speaks to, as I mentioned with the Elton John album, it kind of speaks to the timelessness and uh, the overall compositions of the songs that they can transcend genre like that. And uh, But then, honestly, maybe I shouldn't be surprised that they translate to, con to country so well because uh, the Gibb brothers actually grew up listening to country music, and I think they might have even dabbled in it at the beginning of their recording careers, if I, if I remember correctly. Now, among my list of favorites on this album are Too Much Heaven, on which Barry duets with Alison Krauss, gorgeous vocal harmonies, and a beautiful lush arrangement on that song, unquestionably one of the standouts on this album. And then we have Words featuring Dolly Parton. Yes, he recruits a bunch of uh, legendary uh, legacy country acts as well as recent newcomers. And then we have How Deep Is Your Love, which features Little Big Town and Tommy Emanuel. And also To Love Somebody, which includes Jay Buchanan. Now, uh, Barry Gibb, he does still have a very, very good voice, perhaps just a bit diminished from the Bee Gees glory days, but not by much. I mean, he still is, is very, very good at what he does, uh, great at what he does. I also enjoyed his duet with Sheryl Crow on How Can You Mend a Broken Heart, uh, the opening track I've Gotta Get a Message to You, which features Keith Urban, uh, his duet with Olivia Newton-John on Rest Your Love on Me, and the totally dreamy closing track Butterfly, which features Gillian Welch and David Rawlings. So, as you can tell, I, I found so much to love on this album. I mean, th this thing only has, what, 12 tracks on it, and I just listed like two-thirds of the track listing, so that tells you something right there. But uh, even beyond the music itself, there's another whole level, a personal level, on which I love this album. You see, my late sister loved the Bee Gees. Uh, she was a child of the 70s, so that kind of stands to reason. And she had also developed a fondness for country music in the last several years of her life. So. You know, putting those two things together, as well as a couple of the artists on here, uh, one of her favorite artists was Sheryl Crow. You know, so that all those things together 
I can only imagine how much she would have loved this album. I mean, I just, I just know for a fact she would have found this album just amazingly enjoyable, and she and I would have loved it together, I think. But then, again, maybe not because I didn't really get into this kind of stuff, more into this kind of stuff, until after I in inherited her CD collection. So maybe that's kind of a catch-22, I guess you'd say. But yes, as you can tell, I can't say enough good things about this album. Fantastic. It was my first great album purchase of 2021. You know, after the end of the year that we went through, like 2020, this was a good note to start 2021 on. Let's put it that way. So it's just an, an excellent album. And one of the uh, other things that I'm kind of optimistic about is this album is called Volume 1. So with luck, maybe there's going to be a Volume 2 coming out. And if so, I am only going to be ecstatically, deliriously happy if there is. So yes, needless to say, uh, you got to check this album out. Uh, it's fantastic. Highly recommended. Okay, now next up on today's docket is Medicine at Midnight, the 10th album by The Foo Fighters. Now, this is the first album released while I'm an active fan of The Foo Fighters. I had tried out the band many years ago, but they didn't stick for whatever reason, and I think it's because at the time I was not a fan of rock music that was as hard rock as The Foo Fighters. Uh, Dave Grohl uh, yells a lot and howls a lot in his vocals on a lot of songs, and that was something I was not a fan of back then, but obviously my tastes have changed a little bit. Uh, I heard a song on the radio a few months back that I really liked the sound of. It sounded different than other stuff that's on the radio, and so I either I shazammed it or I looked up the lyrics, and it turned out to be the single Shame Shame off this album, and that's what made me reconsider the Foo Fighters. I streamed their Greatest Hits album, and I really enjoyed that, and coincidentally, I found an eBayer at right about that same time who was selling the Foo Fighters' entire discography on CD, uh, along with a couple of concert DVDs, for a pretty good price. And they, they were all in excellent condition. And so I scooped it up and have been digesting their album steadily ever since. And yes, I consider that money very well spent. But uh, anyway, as for Medicine at Midnight, this is an excellent album. Uh, it has something of an 80s throwback vibe to it over most of the album. At least that's what I hear. You know, being a child of the 80s, I kind of... that kind of tends to be something that I'll, will, I will pick up on songs. Uh, the opener, Making a Fire, has a trace of what sounds to me like Living Color, the, the, the hard rock band Living Color. Uh, Shame Shame gives me a bit of a Red Hot Chili Peppers vibe. Uh, the title track reminds me of Duran Duran, and Love Dies Young kind of sounds like The Cure to me. So a lot of 80s stuff, and even outside of the 80s sounds, uh, the song Holding Poison sounds a little bit like Vertigo Era U2 from like the, what, the late 90s, early 2000s. And No Son of Mine uh, channels Metallica, particularly in the way that Dave Grohl sings the vocals. His vocal delivery on that is, is, is very James Hetfield. So uh, yes, a bunch of great upbeat songs on here. And the song Chasing Birds is a standout for me, mainly because it's a sonic departure from the rest of the album. It's a delicate ballad in an album of mostly full throttle rockers. So in that way, there's a little bit of a sonic shakeup in the track listing, even though that song is next to the last in the track list. But anyway, uh, lyrically, one song that stands out to me is Waiting on a War. And some critics I heard complain that the lyrics are contradictory in that song. Uh, someone who seems to look back fondly on playing with toy guns as a child, now lamenting gun violence as an adult. But to me, it's a statement on how kids, or at least boys, from Dave Grohl's and my generation were all but conditioned to play with guns as children. Cops and robbers, cowboys and Indians, war, etc. So that kind of puts an interesting uh, a spin on that. Uh, it, it might seem contradictory, but if you look at the subtext in the lyrics, that's what I pick up on it anyway. But all in all, yes, this is a very solid album. Uh, my only complaint about it is that it was too short. I, I would have not minded uh, another two or three songs on here. It's only nine tracks, so that's almost EP territory, but still I am not sorry at all that I picked this up and that I got into the Foo Fighters in general. I am still, as I said, still absorbing their track list, their, their discography, uh, finding new things to enjoy every time I listen to one of their albums. But yeah, a, a great, uh, great outing in my opinion. Not some critics' favorite uh, in recent years, but still, in, in, in my opinion, it's an excellent album, gotta say. My next spankin' platter in today's video is Weezer's 14th album, OK Human. Now, similarly to the Foo Fighters, I had checked out Weezer many years ago, uh, sort of liked what I'd heard, uh, actually liked them a little bit more than Foo Fighters, but I didn't pursue them further until recently rediscovering them. And also like Foo Fighters, this is the first album released by Weezer since I became an active fan of theirs. Now, at least one friend I've talked to about this album indicated a mix of frustration and disappointment. 
and he made comments about the band going in a direction that they feel didn't suit them. Uh, I, for one, seldom have these kinds of feelings about an artist, uh, partly because who are we to dictate what direction they should take creatively? Uh, not that that's what my friend was necessarily saying or thinking, but also because I trust that an artist will put out the music that they are creatively motivated to put out. I mean, we kind of have to trust them to do that, don't we? I mean, yes, since we buy their albums and concert tickets, we pay their bills, so to speak, but if we demand that they put out the music we want to hear, what kind of artistic value or artistic merit can we expect it to have, really? And plus, some of us will turn around and call them sellouts anyway. But anyway, uh, to avoid getting off track for much longer here, I'm almost always excited to hear what an artist I like comes up, up with next, uh, to see what direction they go in and how their sound evolves and progresses. And besides, if, we put it, if they put out another album of what was out before, they're going to risk stagnation. Uh, but then again, all this being said, uh, since I'm okay with whatever they put out, it could just as easily be a case of me still being on my honeymoon with Weezer. So maybe that's the reason why I like this album so much. But anyway, as for the album itself, I like the addition of the strings and orchestral instruments, as I've always kind of liked that stuff in pop music anyway. But I can see how classic Weezer devotees might not like that and prefer the electric guitar-based rock sound that they've carried on through most of their career. Now, I really like and appreciate the sentiments in many of the song's lyrics on this album. Uh, numbers, for instance, is about how when we measure ourselves by statistics or numbers, it never goes well. Uh, first of all, we are much more than just a set of metrics anyway. Uh, but also, comparing ourselves to other people is a losing endeavor to begin with. So that's a great song on there. And uh, the song Screens, which has a great groove, by the way, is a treatise of sorts on how we all seem to be putting screens in front of our faces, uh, phones, computers, tablets, uh, for way too many hours each day. But then we come to a song like Grapes of Wrath, which is a love note of sorts to audiobooks as an alternative to TV shows, apparently. But I find it a little weird, since other songs on the album have a bit of an anti-tech sentiment. It's like, why not make the song about actual print books rather than audiobooks? Uh, so, you know, so I, I just found that a little odd. Maybe that's splitting hairs. I don't know. Or, or maybe it's just Weezer being Weezer. The lead-off track and first single, All My Favorite Songs, that might be simple on the surface, but it has what I read anyway as an interesting subtext, and that is wallowing in self-pity or self-doubt until it becomes harmful to your psyche and brings down your uh, self-esteem. So that's, that's, that's a, just a secondary message that I found in that song. Here Comes the Rain is a song that I really connected with. Uh, not only is the melody nice, but I personally rather enjoy the rain. It's kind of why I moved to the Pacific Northwest. And sometimes it does, as the lyrics go, wash all my troubles away. So I really like that song. So yeah, overall, I'm pretty darn happy with this album. Uh, it's actually grown on me quite a bit in subsequent listens. I'm not sure I love it as much as Foo Fighters' Medicine at Midnight, but uh, I'm very, very glad I picked it up and brought it home and listened to it. Very good album. And now for the final item in today's Spankin' Platters video, we have The Lucky Ones by Pentatonix. This is their fourth studio album, not counting EPs and holiday albums. Now, although I do enjoy a cappella music, such as Straight No Chaser, for instance, I honestly didn't pay any attention to Pentatonix until they released their self-titled full-length album in 2015. And if I'm being totally honest, I still don't pay a whole lot of attention to their EPs and albums that are all or mostly covers, which is especially ironic since I actually do have a thing for covers albums. Go figure, right? It's just weird. But anyway, uh, in fact, I actually was not aware that this one was released until I happened upon it in the record store a few weeks ago. And it was, it was kind of funny because I flipped past it without knowing who it was. I only saw like this much of it in the racks the first time I flipped through it. And it was only on my last cursory flip through on my way to the register did I realize it was Pentatonix. And when I did, I dis didn't hesitate to pick up the CD and buy it and bring it home. And I'm honestly kind of glad I did. Uh, Love Me When I Don't is a beautiful song, definitely my favorite on the album. And as the title suggests, it's about a companion's ability to love someone, even when that someone's self-esteem is at a low point. I can see the song becoming a staple at weddings and dances of various types uh, in, in the coming years. So yeah, that's a, that's a standout there. Uh, Bored is probably my second favorite song on the album, and I totally get the lyrics about wanting to pass up a party or a get-together in favor of a quiet night at home instead. 
I just uh, that's just the kind of person I am. Uh, I was not impressed by Never Gonna Cry Again until I really read the lyrics and I realized how close to home they hit for at least one friend of mine who's kind of gone through similar thoughts and circumstances and stuff. So that one kind of has a, a bit more of a, a meaning to me uh, because of that friend and kind of connects me to that friend more now. Uh, In My Eyes sounded so familiar the first few times I heard it uh, until I finally realized it has a melody reminiscent of Orinoco Flow by Enya. Uh, But that similarity doesn't make me uh, enjoy it any less. In fact, I probably like it more because I like Orinoco Flow, that original song that it uh, uh, was possibly inspired by. But honestly, sorry to say, those are about all the thoughts that I have on individual songs on this album. Uh, Pretty much all the other songs are just okay to me, at least for now. Uh, Even though I've listened to this album as many times as all the other albums that I talked about in today's video. But I do suspect that this album will still grow on me uh, as, uh, over repeated listens over the coming weeks and months, uh, especially you know, since that, that one song, uh, Never Gonna Cry Again. As I said, it's got that connection to a friend of mine. So uh, yeah, it's just I, I, this one I've got to uh, digest more. But still, I am not sorry I picked it up, uh, not sorry I spent my money on it. And uh, yeah, it's a very good album. And in fact, all four of the albums that I've bought so far this year in this video, I, I consider to be money well spent. Very, very good albums all around. So anyway, I guess that catches us up on new and recent releases for the time being. Uh, I've noticed that a post-it note that I have taped to my viewfinder has been wiggling a little bit. I've had the windows open and the wind has been blowing, so I hope it has not interfered with the uh, blowing into the camera and the microphone and has been interfering with the sound. I hope the sound turns out okay in this video, but uh, if it doesn't, sorry about that. But anyway, that'll do it for Spank and Platters for winter of 2021. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, hit that like button and share it with your friends. And give me your thoughts, questions, suggestions, or constructive criticisms in the comment section below. Also, scroll down to the description for the links to my Twitter and Instagram feeds, and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and browse my past videos, and be sure to ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.